recording, fantastic. And now we can we can get more into the meat of it. So Bill, first of all, no pun intended. I'm on the ball already. Um, <laughs> thank you for doing this. This is long overdue. I've had you reschedule for me a couple times, so I apologize, better late than never. Um, but I'm really, really excited to chat with you and talk about your book and talk about all the adventures you've been on recently. So um, I kind of almost don't know where to start, but maybe um, you could start by telling our listeners about your most recent food-related uh, travels, because that would be pretty sure. cool. Yeah. I, well, first off, not only thank you for having me, I'm just as thrilled to be here. And I was thinking this morning when I got up, uh, thinking about this discussion and remembering several Christmases ago, how excited I was because the main my main gift that I asked for was your oh, book, and I was so excited to get it. I was so excited nice. to get it. That, so. that, that, I'm honored. That that makes my day. Thank you. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. Um, yeah, so we've had two two trips recently as a family. Uh, one was pure uh, f- uh, research focus, which is, I think, the one you're talking about. And the other one was we, we did a, a food culture and history tour through Ireland that we, we led that tour and that was fantastic as well. But um, the, the the trip to Sardinia, the research trip was mind blowing. And I have to be completely honest, the, the primary reason we picked Sardinia, uh, the primary research interest that we had, and it was a 10 year, it took me 10 years to make the contacts to go do this and, 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 and learn from someone is there's a traditional, and I just give me a second, so I'm gonna talk about plants for one second. There's a traditional egg corn bread that they make in Sardinia, or at least made in Sardinia. Pliny the Elder wrote about it. It's an ancient, ancient bread. Um, and the thing that drew me to it, the thing that I was very excited about, I, I do a lot of work with plant detoxification and traditional ways of making plants safer to eat, is that egg corns have tannic acid. They're they're toxic and in order to safely or more safely consume the egg corns you have to process them in some way and one thing that shows up over and over again around the world with detoxifying certain plants and to, uh, to get rid of certain toxins is the use of geophagy or the intentional consumption of earth so this particular bread this egg corn bread is made with clay earth and ash and I got so excited when I started to read about this and 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 I tried to find somebody, everybody, everybody I talked to, no, nobody knows how to make it anymore. Nobody knows how to make it anymore. There's nobody making it anymore. I even contacted one of the head people at the Nordic Food Lab when it was still associated with Noma. Um, the, you know, it's been the best restaurant in the world for many years. And this person was actually from Sardinia. This research is like, no, there's nobody still making this bread. And I finally put it aside about six or seven years ago and I picked it up again and I finally found um three elderly women that still know how to make this bread in this one little village so we jumped on the opportunity to go that's why we went but what we discovered besides all of that wonderfulness is we just happened to be uh, spending most of our time in the epicenter of the first identified blue zone Mm. which is in uh, a lot of it was in a a village called villa grande and we had made contact with a food historian and author uh, in th- that lived in this area, and I said, "Listen, there's so many things that I want to learn. Uh, can we spend time together and and make all these traditional dishes?" And we did. And one of the things that I found, uh, which shouldn't be a huge surprise to the people that are listening to you already because they're already tuned into this, is that we spent a lot of time with traditional families eating traditional food, and we ate almost no vegetables whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It was the exact opposite of everything that was that's been documented and. Uh, you know, in almost every conversation I have with someone who's a vegetarian or a vegan, the first thing I say, well, you know about the blue zones, you know about the blue zones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, now I do know about the blue zones. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know how how deep you want to dive, but I can tell you about a couple experiences where not only were we eating um, a lot of meat, but a lot of animal, which I think is the most important part. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, we might jump around all over the place because there's so many things we could talk about, but I made a note specifically. So your book, Eat Like a Human. I mean, first of all, I, I, there was so much in here that resonated with me and the messages that I feel strongly about in the book that I wrote. And I, I, I really like that you, the, I feel like one of the focuses of this book and a lot of the work that you do is asking people to just think about their food maybe in a different way than mm. they have previously and maybe in a maybe in a more mindful way maybe in a deeper way than just like what's good to eat what's appropriate to eat what's going to make me look a certain way there's just there's so many more layers to how we think about 
how to eat. And yeah. I think that's really, really important. But one of the interesting things um, in your book, one of the many interesting things in the meat chapter, you kind of have this line about like more animal, less meat, which I have never really actually thought about it in those terms. But of course, that's sort of similar to what I'm trying to tell people is it's about eating the whole animal. And really the muscle meat is like the least important part of the equation. So it seems like that's what you're saying is going on in blue zones as well. Yeah. And, and, and there's, so, there's so many things we can dive into. What, what I'll just I'll touch upon two things very quickly before um, I dive a little deeper in, in, into that. One is from a uh, prehistoric perspective, and I mean, from our deep dietary, you know, ancestral dietary past, what we see is when meat enters the diet, there isn't a lot of uh, biological change in our ancestors. There's not a huge jump in brain size. There's not a huge jump in body size. When we start hunting and we have first access to the animal and have the opportunity to not only eat all the flesh, all the meat, but also all of the blood, fat, and organs, the most nutrient-dense bioavailable parts of those animals, uh, that's when we see the largest jump in body and brain size at any time in our evolutionary past. Now, that didn't push us to do that. It actually just supported that body and brain growth, That, you know, at least as far as I'm concerned. It, it literally fueled us becoming human. And this is the difference so there, between, just to stop you there, the difference between like being a scavenger, picking at the leftovers versus having the skill or the tools or the ability to hunt so that we get access to the whole animal, right? That's the distinction you're making? 100%. Yeah, okay. And and if you and if you watch, and it still happens today on the savanna, if, if you watch a, a an apex predator take down its prey, it doesn't take down its prey and just sit there and gnaw on the shoulder. I don't care what like Nat Geo, you know, Discovery Channel things you've watched. Because the other part's gorier. What they do is, you know, because that's what they show, when an, an apex predator takes down its prey, the first thing it does is rip it open and dive in and gorge themselves on the most nutrient dense bio bioavailable parts of that animal, the blood, the fat, and the organs. Then they go off and they sleep. Uh, they die to digest their meal, kind of like in the, the, the example I always give is it's kind of like after Thanksgiving, we have a, uh, Uncle Bob. He would he would gorge himself at dinner, and then with his shoes on, he'd go <laughs> lay down on a couch, our couch, with his feet up, and and sleep. I mean, it's the same thing that a lion would do. It's the same thing that a lion's ancestor three million years ago would do. And this, so what they do is they actually leave these huge carcasses covered in meat on the savanna, and there's a moment of kind of relative safety for scavengers to run in and, and and get that meat buzzards hyenas that sort of thing our ancestors armed with stone tools were doing the same thing and they, were, they had access to the meat but when they could hunt they became the apex predator they be you know they had first access to, to all of the most nutrient dense parts so from that an evolutionary perspective eating the entire animal makes sense this isn't to say we shouldn't eat the meat this is to say we need to prioritize the entire animal so that that's one thing the second thing is and you made a very very good point when we eat, there's so many different factors influencing how we eat, how satisfied we are. In, in my in my mind, also, um, if we're truly being nourished, I mean, there's bio. Everybody pays attention to biological nourishment. We need these macros, these micros. We need to, you know, these eating windows or whatever it is. All those things are very, very important. But for humans, food is so wrapped up in literally everything we do and everything we are that you can't uh, disassociate nourishment from your politics, from your tradition, from your socioeconomic status, you know, all of the ways that we eat. If we want to be truly fully nourished, we need to take all of these things into account. So when it comes to animals, the, you know, nutrient density, bioavailability, the safety of it is all very important to me. But to fully nourish myself, especially when we're talking about um, including animals in my diet, the ethics involved with it and the sustainability involved with, with, with it all play a very, very large role. And when you start eating the entire animal, you start checking all of those boxes. It becomes much more clear. This is this point is also why I really appreciate a lot of the way you communicate and the way I try to communicate about food to my audiences. And that way that I'm speaking about is openly and without judgment and with like kindness and a spirit of like curiosity, where I feel like so much of the way a lot of um, food authority figures, or dare I say, I hate the word influencers online speak, which yeah. is very fear mongering and very much like you're doing everything wrong. You're going to die an early death because you're eating this. You need to eat this other thing. And to your point, 
it's more than just making a choice, a better choice or a less good choice. There are politics involved. Mm -hmm. There are socioeconomic factors involved. There are cultural factors involved. And that's why people take how they eat so personally and why we could be so defensive when we're told something or why we can, um, you know, maybe disagree with scientific facts that are given to us because it doesn't align with maybe things that we were taught or, you know, so I think it's really important, like you said, to really take all these factors into account when we're trying to maybe educate or teach people. It's not so simple to just write down this food is bad. This food is good. If you make this choice, mm. you're wrong. If you make this choice, you're right. And I think that there's too much of that black and white kind of thinking, especially online, which is how so many of us communicate and, and deal these days. And I just think it's so important that we, we appreciate that and bring that into account because it's, I have found personally, and I don't want to make this like a whole kind of negative um, rabbit hole. So we'll bounce off this soon, but like, <laughs> I have found that I follow people maybe online or, uh, you know, different um, thought leaders where I believe in everything that they're saying, but I hate the way they say it so much that I, I'm turned off and I'm like, I'm on your side and I'm turned off by this. So I just think that's why it's so important to just have this, you know, like one of the reasons I love following you and I love talking to you is because there's just this sense of like excitement and curiosity and positivity about learning about new things. And that's what I talk about with my organ meat journey. Cause I didn't grow up eating this way. I'm not, you know, classically trained in any sense, mm. but I've always looked at trying new foods with this like sense of kind of excitement and wonder. And, you know, if you try something and you don't like it, that's okay, but you, you haven't lost anything. But if you try something and you do like it, it could open up like this entire new world for you. That's so positive and potentially nourishing and, and uh, you know, life-changing in a, in a good way. And I think again, to kind of veer off and we can come back around, but Another really important aspect of the book, and I think your personal journey to the work that you do, that I think people would be surprised about, and I think the majority of our listeners are women, but men and women both would be interested to hear this part of your story, that a lot of your curiosity and a lot of your drive to understand food stems from having some kind of disordered uh, relationship with food when you were younger and kind of having some issues with eating and, and weight and what food meant to you as you were growing up. And I just, I'd like to kind of touch on that for a minute because you don't look like somebody who struggles with their food and you, you're not the avatar of a person who has struggled with weight or food or food choices, you know? So I think it's mm -hmm. important to have people like you be visible and talk about this stuff because we don't necessarily um, think that you would be somebody who would struggle like that. Well, that's, that's a very good point. You know, I have a, I have a good friend. He's a good friend now. When we first met years ago, he, he struggled with his weight his entire life. And I would talk about these sorts of things to him uh, for years. And he kind of got the blank. He, I got the blanks there, uh, you know, response from him. And then it was only about two years ago where I posted a couple of pictures of myself from several decades ago. And, he's, and he came up to me and he goes, whoa, you should have told me. I said, what, what do you mean? He goes, I can relate to you now. Like, I, I couldn't relate to you before. I thought, you know, you were lean your whole life or whatever. But I can relate better to you. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. And it's about that relationship. So first off, one of the things that I focus on all of my work right now, all of my teaching and the classes that we run, the, the, all of it, to me, the one of the most important things is about connection. It's about connecting with your food, connecting with your environment, connecting with yourself, connecting with your family, all of those things. And food allows you to do that when you have that uh, kind of comprehensive uh, new world view of, uh, of food. And I think my my journey, the, the best way to talk about it, and, and I'll do a quick, we can dive into anything you want deeper, but I'll do a quick version of it, is my worldview and how I looked at myself and, 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 and my relationship with food is what changed a lot over time. That was the most important part. I mean, I went through a lot of different shifts in, in weight and muscle and, and health, but my relationship with food, I think, is, is the way I like to tell the story. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and my parents did the best with the information that they had. They, of course, wanted to keep me healthy, but they were told, you know, get rid of all the butter, put the margarine in, eat the nut and seed oils, replace all the beef with lean pork and the leanest chicken breast you can find, you know, eat carbs all the time, eat six times a day. Um, and I was, I was chubby. I mean, I was, I was a, a very chubby, overweight kid who was so carb addicted that I would wake up every morning. The first thought on my mind is, when am I going to eat? Because my stomach literally hurt hurt because it was it was craving food i'd eat my you know carb rich breakfast 
At 10 o'clock, I was hungry. At 12 o'clock, I was hungry. I'd have a snack after school. I'd have dinner. I'd have a snack before bed. I mean, I'm hitting all the six things. And I was so upset with myself and so chubby. And so, you know, I was getting made fun of at school all the time. There was an act, and this is not a joke. There was an actual year um, in middle school where I literally got beat up on the playground every single day. I mean, every single day. And I re- and this is, uh, and I, I just I only told this story twice before, but uh, but it is an important one because I think, you know, listening. If, if there's anything I can ever say where somebody's listening and connect it, can connect with it at some level and it makes a difference, it's worth it. But it's a little bit of an embarrassing story. So I remember it. I was in, I don't know, maybe I was 12 years old, something, and uh, you know, I was in my house and I was about to take a shower. So the shower's running. I was naked because I was about to get into the shower. And I had to go to the bathroom. So I sit down. It's embarrassing. So I go, I go to, I sit down on the toilet. And you know, when you look down on yourself, mm-hmm, anyhow, mm-hmm. you always think you're bigger than you are. And then when you sit down, it makes it even worse. But I remember I was so upset with myself. And I sit down and I looked down at myself. So I was naked because I've seen my whole body. Mm-hmm. And I just saw the rolls. And I remember taking both of my hands and grabbing the rolls and just, and, 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 and I literally said out loud, oh my God, if somebody could just tell me what I should eat. All my problems will be solved. Like I was literally, there was tears running down my face. And I just, I just had this horrible relationship with food. At that time, there were, there were numerous things about the way that I felt about myself that were completely problematic. Mm-hmm. But one of them was um, that I thought all my problems would be solved <laughs> if I got lean. Um, the other one was, and we'll dive into this a little bit deeper, is it isn't just about what we're eating, but about how we're eating. Um, but my relationship with food at that time was I knew I had to eat to live, but food was something that made me fat. It made me ugly. It made kids make fun of me. It made me feel terrible. Then I, when I hit high school, I had no business being an athlete. Like I wasn't built like an athlete. And um, I, I started to run when I was in seventh or eighth grade. And, and, and the funny story was I, I, I was in Boy Scouts and uh, there was there's something called Order of the Arrow. And it's kind of this special group in Boy Scouts you can get elected to do and you you have to go through all these different things. And and it was a weekend coming up where we had to do the service work in the woods and camp, kind of do the survival thing in the woods and all this. And I had no idea what was coming, but I actually thought I was going to have to be in a loincloth. (laughs) I didn't, but I thought I was going to have to be in a loincloth. And I had months ahead of this. So I said, oh my God, I can't go in the loincloth looking this, looking this fat. So I started running like massive amounts of running. And a lot of the weight was coming off, even though my diet was poor. I was I was so intent on not getting into a loincloth. Being there, there was no loincloth Thank involved goodness. with anything. I find <laughs> yeah. out later on, but I, but I started running, so I ended up getting lean. I wasn't very muscular, but I uh, I ended up uh, uh, wrestling in high school, and I loved it. And I loved it so much. I was working out three times a day. I was putting on muscle. I looked the part of an athlete, but I was still. I had all sorts of metabolic issues, but I looked at least looked the part of an athlete. And my relationship went from, you know, being, uh, um, you know, thinking food made me ugly to I'm scared of food now because I had to make weight every week for wrestling. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and food now is something that was preventing me from possibly competing. And the relationship between wrestlers and food, especially then, is really, really problematic. When I got the, I ended up doing well, I, I um, got recruited to wrestle at Ohio State, which is one of the best Division One programs in the country then. And it still is amazing. Um, I was losing 22 pounds in a day and a half every week during the season. And we had nutritionists, we had team doctors, we, we had all these people telling us how to eat. It was all horrible information because it was still a product of the 80s and the 90s. Um, high carb. We would go out and eat these, you know, literally pasta mm-hmm. dinners with no sauce, no nothing, just massive amounts of pasta because it was so cheap. And that, that's but that's what we were told we should be eating. And the worst part, my kind of low point was when I stopped wrestling, I was I stopped competing, I stopped working out, and all this weight just flooded on. And oh, I had all sorts of metabolic mm-hmm. issues. Uh, it was so bad that when my wife and I met, we would go, we didn't have much money. We were we were in graduate school and um we were working at a restaurant. And anyhow, we would go, we'd save all of our money and go out to eat every now and then. Not very often, but it was a big deal when we could actually afford to go out to eat. And my body was so screwed up that we get into the car, we drive to wherever we're eating. It was 15 minutes away, hour away, it didn't matter. And my focus was looking out the windows of the car to see all the places that might have a bathroom mm-hmm. so that when I came back, I had nowhere to stop. Mm-hmm. And 
there was never a time that we went out to dinner that we didn't stop at least once, if not multiple times on the way home because I completely lost dinner. My digestive tract was completely screwed up. This entire time, I'm listening to nutritionists, doctors, everybody reading all the magazines, men's health, men's you know, muscle and fitness, all those things. And it wasn't until, and nothing worked, I, South Beat, all mm-hmm. the things. And it wasn't until I started to look at, you know, I'm an archaeologist and anthropologist. I started to look at ancestral diets really look at what people were eating um, in the past and also traditional diets around the world today. And when I started to implement those things into my diet, everything changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything changed, but not only, you know, from a, from a kind of a physique perspective, but from a health perspective, I'm 50 years old now and I'm in 10 times better health than I was as a division one athlete in college. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have so many questions that came out of that, that story, but first of all, (laughs) Thank you for sharing. And I do think so many listeners are going to relate to one or many parts of that story. So I appreciate you sharing it. A couple just quick questions before we go into, again, I really do want to talk about like the how of, of eating and, and sure. whatever, but just really quickly first, what kind of training or exercise do you do now? And do you ever wrestle or do that kind of training anymore? I would love to continue to wrestle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I haven't been. I just we're we're super busy. Yeah. Um, my son, who's an incredible athlete, started to wrestle twice. He loves soccer. He loves lacrosse. He started to wrestle twice, and I coached him when he was younger. Um, he he just didn't, he didn't didn't like it as much. He liked other sports. So I wrestled a little bit then, but not not as okay. much. Um, except for I, this is only thirty seconds, but it's worth it. Um, when he was super young, uh. I, you know, I was one of his coaches along with some other dads and we went to this kind of state, he went to the state tournament and at the end of it, all the dads were like, man, we should, we should compete in like a, you know, masters, you know, tournament or something. I'm like, yeah, let's go. We're going to get in shape. And I came home and it was nighttime because we had driven a while. And I said, Christina, my wife, I said, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start competing again. She's like, whatever. I'm, like, I'm going to go run right now. It was eight o'clock at night and uh, it was dark out. And she goes, yeah, whatever. And I leave and I'm, I stepped in a pothole when I was running about 30 yards from my front, er, from my, from my driveway, broke my ankle, ended up in the hospital. It was terrible. But, um, so no, I, you sound like my husband, you sound like my husband. That's a different story. (laughs) Anyway, continue. Anyway, this is what I do now. Um, I do run and I run because, um, it's where how my wife and I actually spend time. We, we, my wife and I go and run and we talk like we, 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 we run at a conversational Mm -hmm. speed and it's the only time we can be alone and there's no electronic influences, mm-hmm. nothing. And that's a it, it that's one of those things that you know is is nourishing on a lot of different mm-hmm. levels. I do pull-ups and push-ups and sit-ups every single day nice. because I know I can do that. And I, I go to the gym as much as I can, but we are so busy mm-hmm. here right now. Um, we've just expanded. I know that I can't get there as much as I want. So I make sure at least I have that baseline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll talk about the uh, the expansion and the work that you're doing too. But um, so the other kind of um, practical question that comes out of this story is when you did start kind of looking into this ancestral health and all that kind of that sort of area of nutrition, how long did it take you to heal? Because as we know, I mean, gut health issues, digestive health issues, all of that kind of stuff is, and also the mental side of it, like having to rewire your kind of understanding of eating, all of this can be extremely complicated and layered and take a really long time. And that's what sure. makes, I think, a lot of gut health issues so tough is people can feel like they're doing the right thing for a very long time and not really seeing the results that they want. And it's really, really hard to stick to something when you don't see like the tangible benefits right away. Obviously we, um, sometimes have a hard time with the delayed gratification side of life. So how long did it take you to heal these, these gut issues when you started kind of figuring out what to do? I went through, I would say three phases. One of the things I don't do well is, is ease into things. I, I dive in when I think I had something figured out, I dive in, you know, dive right I, into the pothole. I'm sure you can relate. <laughs> yeah. So I need like to dive into the pothole. So I, I, I dive in. Um, I went through three different phases. I, I would say when it started, uh, when I really started to get a handle on it and really started to implement these things into my life, you know, high, uh, you know, lots of animal, lots of high quality animal fat, high quality animal protein, organ meats, those sorts of things much lower carb. Um, I saw some immediate changes. I mean, the weight literally started to pour off probably mostly because I was on such a low carb diet. Um, but my body shape started to change very, very quickly, which helped me 
you know, stick to it and and have that understanding. Yeah, maybe I'm maybe I finally I'm I'm on the right thing. And the nice thing is I wasn't hungry. I wasn't I, I was satiated. The food I was eating, I was actually for the first time in my life, I had lost weight numerous times in the past, but I never lost weight while feeling good. I always lost weight and I was putting myself on such a restrictive diet that I, f- I was always hungry. I always felt like hell. Here I was actually losing weight. My body was changing and I felt satiated. I felt good, you know. So that was that started fairly quickly. The gut health took longer. Um, and I would say until I really had a handle on on really good gut health, it it was probably, I would say probably two years or three years until I really felt like, wow, I have I've guts like I did now, you know, when I when I was a kid. So that that helped. But and here's a really important thing. I about six years ago, um, I, I was still suffering with, with these pains that I was undiagnosed. I had something that the hospital told me was gout, which wasn't. They never tested me for uric acid, but I had this thing on my foot. I had neck pain. I had issues with my corneas, like sensitivity, um, just overall a, a, achy joints, that sort of thing, creaking up and down when I walked up and down the stairs. And I kept going to the doctors and like they're like, nothing's wrong with you. Like, well, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Um, and six years ago, I had a several minute conversation with my now good friend, Sally Norton, who wrote a great book called Toxic Superfoods. And she turned me on to the world of oxalates. And that was the last thing that I had to get out of my diet. And when I got out, of, when I took oxalates out of my diet, everything else that I was suffering from literally went away. Amazing. Do you find now that do you feel like there are any echoes of that sensitivity or if, for example, and I don't think you would, but if you decided to like go off the rails for a couple of days and like eat just processed garbage, would you like, do you have sort of a predisposition? Like, could you slide back or do you think your gut is healed enough? Cause this is one of the, I think one of the elements that I think is, is important. You know, again, we, in this black and white nutrition world that we sometimes are, are dealing with, it's sort of like now that you know what's healthy and what's right, you can never veer. You can never treat yourself. You can never enjoy something that's maybe less optimal. And I think that we should hopefully be striving for, you know, the most resilient bodies possible, which means taking care of ourselves and eating well. But it also means that maybe sometimes you have a piece of birthday cake or maybe sometimes you have a couple glasses of wine and, you know, those are always calculated decisions that you make, but you don't want to fall apart the moment that maybe you, you veer off a little bit, right? So how do you feel about that kind of balance? And do you feel like you've hit a place of healing where you can kind of, you can do that safely? I can. And part of it is biological and part of it's mental. And let me hit the mental piece first real quick. I am that person who, if I eat an Oreo, like literally you have to hide the bag because I will finish the entire yeah. bag. It's, it's, oh my God, I, you know, everything went to hell, the day's ruined, and I'm going to eat the whole bag. And actually, another great friend of mine who I absolutely adore, Mindy Peltz. I don't know if you know Mindy Peltz. Um, Dr. Mindy Peltz, she's The awesome. name is familiar, but I don't think I know her. She just came out, of the, she's written several books, but her most recent one is Fast Like a Girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's great. And, and it's focused on uh, perimenopausal women fasting and that sort of thing. But anyhow, uh, she said to me once, don't think of it as a cheat day think of it as a cheat meal like if you're going to cheat if you feel like you've cheated you know make it you've cheated for this meal the entire day isn't gone you know it's it's one small segment of your day and you don't have to wait till like this magic thing that happens at midnight when your clock resets to start eating good again you know and that that's one thing and the other thing she said is maybe you should rethink this idea of cheating Mm -hmm. she likes to use the word feast Mm -hmm. it's a feast meal and that mindset from something that's negative to something that's neutral or positive has made a big difference for me as well. So that's one thing. The other thing is remember, and, and I wholeheartedly believe this, you know, this is coming from somebody who literally was able to heal themselves and then transform this approach to something that nourished my family. And now we're nourishing the community with it. Yeah. It, could you and I sit here and, and make the case from a biological perspective you can get everything you need, you know, from animals and literally just eat liver and heart and tongue and, you know, mm-hmm. 
bone broth and marrow and meat and all these things for the rest of your life. And that's the and and perhaps we could probably even make the case that, you know, somebody like Anthony Chafee would say we are obligate carnivores and that is the best possible thing you can be eating. And he's probably right. But we're not living in this vacuum like we have. You know, all these other things that influence how we eat. I mean, eating is such a communal thing for humans. There's a great book uh, a woman named Frances Burton wrote, and she says in it, the way humans share food is the single thing that separates humans from all the other animals on the planet. You know, we're always looking for things to separate humans from other animals. Okay, humans make tools. Well, other animals make tools. You know, humans can communicate. Well, other animals can communicate. And all these, but, but this thing, and she gives, she paints a really good picture. She says, okay, imagine a table. and you know, you put a bunch of hungry animals around the table. They're looking at one another, which is a sign of aggression in the animal world. They're showing their teeth as they're eating, which is a sign of aggression in, in the animal world. And then you put food down in the middle of it. What happens? Now, it's an all-out melee. Do other animals eat at the same time? Yes. But do they, other than maybe uh, parents to children sort of thing, do animals share food? No. But humans do. We come around that same table. We have eye-to-eye -eye contact. We show our teeth. We're hungry. We're eating. And we find amazing value in this. It, it is a nourishing act more than just the food. So there's things that we're, the way that we nourish ourselves is more than just getting that biological nutrition. I love, absolutely love the smell, the taste, the texture, even the, the sound of biting into a warm loaf of sourdough bread covered in butter. I mean, good slice it's covered in butter. Love it. Is there any biological requirement for bread? Absolutely. In humans, absolutely not. But I, it brings me back to certain times, you know, in my mind. And I, there, there's something about that that is nourishing. Should I eat every bread every day? Absolutely not. Are there some breads that are better to eat than others? 100%. So, you know, when we're trying to rate, and this is what I found really trying to raise my kids, you know, they have so many pressures hitting them all the time. Many of them are revolving around food. Many of the acts kids engage in today are all centered at some level around food. This dogmatic sort of orthorexic approach where it's all this and none of this will get our kids nowhere. And there's a couple of things that we figured out to try to help with that. But um, it, we have to figure out, here's the baseline. This is what we do. But here are the other things that, you know, from a mental, from a cultural, from an emotional perspective, these sorts of ways of, uh, you know, other things besides just eating a bunch of liver every day are, are, are very, very nourishing and at some level are just as nourishing as the biological piece. Mm -hmm. So from so to answer your question, yes, I, I do engage in other things other than just animal food. For I, I do have a list of requirements for what it goes through. But the other part is the birthday cake, which was, you know, my entire last chapter of the book was about this because I realized I, when I started to get my health back and I was diving down this rabbit hole and I was very, very strict from it, literally at an orthorexic perspective, because remember, I, I spent my entire life with this incredibly unhealthy relationship with food. And now all of a sudden, you know, in, in pain and, and, and discomfort and poor self body image. Now I'm finally getting the life that I want. I'm like, I'm doing everything I can. I literally wouldn't eat my own kid's birthday cake, not even a bite. And some of those, and I'm so embarrassed to say this, some of those cakes were baked by my older daughter for my younger daughter's birthday. So my my one daughter made it. It was my younger daughter's birthday. And here I am watching everybody else eat like I'm some some kind of martyr that I'm, I, you know, I'm getting. I, the, the cultural nourishment there, yes. <laughs> emotional was not, yes. you know, wasn't there. And everybody suffered as a result. Mm -hmm. of it. So now my rule is I will always eat a, a bite of a birthday cake, love a bite that. or whatever, but I will always. Eat. I love that. And I'm now... I can't stop thinking about sourdough with a lot of butter on it, like a nice warm piece of sourdough. <laughs> so come, you, you need to Ooh, come. I really do. We'll we'll talk about that soon. But okay, so let's get into some parts of the book that I want to dive into more because we can, we can talk about organ meats all day long. Everybody who listens to this already kind of knows my stance on that. But one of the parts I wanted to like dig in with your book because I don't know as much about it is so we're talking about the how of making food and there's a. a a huge part of, of your book, you're talking about like the different chapters, there's grains, animal, plants, dairy, the undercurrent 
is fermentation. And, you know, mm. anybody who's listening to this knows about fermented foods, probably on some level. And they think about sauerkraut, maybe, and maybe they think about sourdough because again, in the pandemic, all of us became sourdough uh, bread makers. Mm. I actually didn't because I was late. Well, I was writing cookbooks instead. So, and I, you know, I didn't get to it, but I did eat a lot of sourdough. Um, but, you know, they think about, there's a couple different things they think about with fermentation. And we kind of generally know fermented foods are tend to be pretty healthy. Um, but I think you take it a step further and there's a lot more recipes in this book where you're fermenting things that I didn't even realize could be fermented or should be tried fermented. Can you talk a little bit about why that is such an important um, mm. method of preparing, making foods? Why is fermentation so good? So there's a couple of points. One is I've done a lot of work looking at ancestral diets, but also traditional diets around the world today. And I have never found a traditional food way at any time in the world, in any place in the world that doesn't have fermentation literally at its core. Okay. Um, the other thing about fermentation that's important to understand is that it is, it, it's actually, food is rotting but we're controlling it. Mm -hmm. We're controlling that rot for a certain purpose. Now, humans, we have an incredibly inefficient digestive tract. And in order to eat most of the foods that we eat, we need help, some kind of technological help. Sometimes that means cooking. Sometimes that means grinding it up. Um, quite often, it means a combination of chemical and physical changes like fermentation that help make food safer and help make the nutrients more readily available to our body. So this is what fermentation can provide. One is it starts to chemically and physically break down that food, which means it's going to be easier for our bodies to digest that food and get the nutrients uh, in the state they need to be to get them where they need to be in our bodies. So there's that benefit. The other benefit is um, it, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of fermentation. But if you think about a pH scale with like seven at the middle, which is water, right, which is neutral, anything as you go down on that pH scale and the numbers get smaller, things become more acidic. And as it gets higher, it becomes more basic or alkaline. Um, seven, even though that's you know water, is an actually very dangerous place to be for pathogens. Like all sorts of good and bad pa uh, bacterias and, and other microorganisms can can live in that zone. That's why you like you never want to go swimming in a in a pond in August somewhere because it's probably filled with all kinds of flesh eating bacteria. But as you ferment, and there's most ferments that we're familiar with today are um, uh, acid ferments. So as you ferment and the microorganisms and bacteria are, are eating things like sugars and carbohydrates, they produce lactic acid and the pH goes down, so it becomes more acidic. There are some, especially with meat, um, alkaline ferments where it actually goes in the other direction. But in each, in each uh, case, what, no matter, you know, when you're getting away from that neutral zone, you get into a very, very safe place where pathogenic microorganisms can't survive. And like, for example, when we make sauerkraut here, other fermented vegetables, by law, I have to get down to about 4.2, a pH of 4.2, because uh, we know that down there, the bad things that can be taking place aren't, aren't going to live. And then I can go ahead and sell you my sauerkraut if, and we know it's safe because I'm, I'm at that state. So there's a, there's a margin of safety that's created by these, by the fermentation. Um, it also is completely alive, so it's full of probiotics, which we know. Um, and depending on the ferment, what you're fermenting, it could be full of probiotics. And the food for the probiotics, the prebiotics itself, um, it enhances flavor, it enhances aroma, it enhances texture. So it's a more pleasant thing to eat than the raw ingredient itself in many cases. Um, it also, especially because of that, for several reasons, but one is the change in pH, it is storable for a much longer period of time. So there's all these wonderful benefits to fermentation. What people may not realize is almost every food that we truly, um, you know, really, really enjoy, even today in the modern world, the traditional version of it was fermented. So obviously things like sauerkraut and pickles and all that are fermented. The most high quality chocolate in the world mm -hmm. has a fermentation step. The highest quality coffee in the world has a fermentation mm -hmm. step. Any real traditional cheese in the world is a fermented dairy product. Um, the original butter, the best butter in the world is a, is, is a fermented product. Mm -hmm. The, as you know, the, um, 
you know, there's a whole lot of different kind of charcuterie and salumi that is fermented. Mm -hmm. So a real piece of salami is raw meat that's been fermented, mm -hmm. right? So if fermentation is, is at the core of literally just about everything, even foods, if you ate the real versions of them um, today that we enjoy, um, it's it, it's at its course. There's wonderful things and we can ferment literally just about mm -hmm. anything. Oh, the other, oh, the other, I'm sorry, one last thing. Fermentation also has the ability to detoxify. So if, especially certain kinds of plants, it's not for all plants and not for all toxins, but there are some toxins that when you ferment the plant itself, you either reduce or eliminate the toxins in that mm -hmm. plant. Yeah. That brings up another point. I made a note of this when I was reading the book, because again, you, you definitely did the job you wanted in writing this book in terms of making people think about food differently, because there were a couple of points where I was like, okay, I literally have never thought about it this way. And one of these, these moments that I had was so the eating plants and how most plants have sort of toxic defense systems built in that we have mm -hmm. to override, or in some cases we just ignore. And that's why a lot of us have um, problems, right? Because we think that eating mostly vegetables is good and we're not maybe preparing them properly. But I always kind of had this maybe misconception or just a, a difference in looking at it in thinking like humans are actually incredibly, we, I think we are adaptable uh, creatures. Obviously we've made it this far mm. um, for better or worse. We're not always doing the, the best things to be adaptable, but we are surviving under some crazy circumstances. And, you know, our ancestors were scavengers similar to vultures and hyenas and goats that can eat anything. You know, like I always thought of humans as like, we're like trash compactors, right? For better or worse, we can eat anything. But the reality is we kind of can, but to our detriment, and it's making us very unhealthy. And we can also kind of eat anything because we were lucky enough to get these big brains that enabled us to create tools and create methods to actually eat things um, more effectively because internally we aren't very good at eating most things. So it was a really interesting right. switch for me because I always thought like, yeah, we can, we can kind of do anything, but really, you know, you show some examples in the book about how most animals are finely attuned to eating a very specific diet. That's what they eat. And their bodies are made to do that. Whereas our bodies are kind of like, we're sort of half-assed at, at eating everything. <laughs> and so we have to get really good at almost pre-digesting in some ways and preparing things so that they're, we're better able to deal with it. Right. Um, but it was just a really interesting kind of shift that I had. And, you know, you're talking about one, another point of this that was interesting to me that I think people may not have thought of. There's a lot of conversation about eating plants and produce seasonally, right? And generally mm -hmm. the conversation is around um, it's more sustainable um, and it's more sort of in line with how, um, you know, ancestral humans may have eaten. But the other point, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm not saying this right, but it also is maybe more optimal to eat plants that are in season because then you're not getting some of the maybe low dose toxic effects of these plants year round all the time. You're sort of switching things right. in and out, which is again, not something that I, I never thought of it that way. But if you are eating plants that maybe have like spinach, for example, and things that just, you know, maybe if you're eating a ton of them all the time, these so-called plant superfoods that are actually potentially damaging to your system, at least if you're kind of switching them in and out for other plants and other produce here and there, it's like you're you're sort of switching it up and you're not kind of getting this toxic load that's going to be overwhelming. Is that accurate to say? Uh, absolutely. Okay. So the, the first thing you said, and you did a great job with it, we, we are trash cut packers. We eat massive, yeah. ma we, we eat just about right. anything. We say humans are omnivores. Anthony Chafee would say humans are obligate carnivores, which he makes a good point, but humans are omnivores, yes. but not by design. Mm -hmm. We're not biologically designed to be omnivores. We are omnivores through technology. Mm -hmm. It's because we can create a tool and harvest an animal. Mm -hmm. It's because we can create a technique and detoxify a plant or make the nutrients in it, something like fermentation more, more readily available to our bodies. It's a really important piece that everybody needs to understand that um, and, and, and when you look at technologies in the past, and I'll just hit this really quickly because it's very important. Um, up until the agriculture revolution, which, which depending on where you are in the world is somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years ago. So don't think about farming. Mm -hmm. Think about hunter gatherers running around for the majority of our existence, eating things from the landscape. The technologies that our ancestors developed that allowed 
them to access animals for food, almost all of them had to do with getting the animal. Overcoming our physical limitations and making bows and arrows and slings and atlatl darts and boomerangs and nets and traps and all those sorts of things. Once we get that animal, all you need is a sharp edge, sharp edge of a rock, and you cut it open and you can, without any other help, just about get most all the nutrition out of that animal without cooking, without grinding, without doing any of those other mm -hmm. things. Cooking helps a little bit with meat, but regardless, you, that's it. The technological input for plants is the exact opposite. As hunter-gatherers, maybe we need a stick to dig into the ground to get some roots, but for the most part, you don't need any, you're harvesting things with your fingers, you're, you know, you're, you're carrying things, right? All the technological input needed to include those plants in our diet and there's massive amounts of these that I, that we require is all about making the plants safe to us, you know, detoxifying them and then making the nutrients in them actually available to our bodies. And that's a really big, a, a really, really big difference. Um, so again, we're, we're omnivores by technology, not by design. There's one food that humans are perfectly designed to consume. I mean, literally, if you look at other wild animals, you know, cows, for example, are perfectly designed to eat really tough vegetable material. Like they, they start chewing it, they have the right palate, they have this corrugated palate, so the roof of their mouth is corrugated. They have these huge massive teeth that, and, they, and they chew like this and they grind up this tough vegetable material and they swallow it and it goes into the first chamber of their stomach, which is a fermentation chamber and it ferments and then they throw up in their mouth and they chew it again and they swallow it Such again. It's a beautiful it process. It's beautiful. Well, and, and rabbits, rabbits are what we call hind gut fermenters. It's even worse rabbits, they have a fermentation chamber at the end of their digestive tract. So they eat food, it goes through, it's partially digested, they get some of the nutrients out of it, it goes to the back of their digestive tract, it ferments, they poop it out, they turn around, eat the poop, it goes through a second time and they get the rest of the nutrition out of it. And if you keep a rabbit in a cage and all the poop is falling through, you're actually working against their mm. biological, you know, designed mm. to get all their food. And they can tell the difference between the first time it goes through and the second time. They don't eat it after the second time, they eat it after the first mm -hmm. time. So there's all of these behavior patterns and, and physical designs and digestive tracts of other animals that allow them to eat a specific diet and be fully nourished from it. Humans are different. Because we've had technological input for literally three and a half million years, and we've been augmenting what we what we physically have that allows us to get food and get the nutrition out of that food, we built bodies and we built these brains on the back of all that technology. And if you ripped all that technology away, we would literally starve to death. We need that technology to transform the materials around us. We, we started to out eat our digestive tracts millions of years mm -hmm. ago. The one food, however, that we are perfectly designed to consume is dairy, mm -hmm. raw dairy from our mothers when we're infants. Mm -hmm. That's it. We're a mammal, and that's exactly now when we start to get weaned, just like all of the mammals, we lose the ability to safely and efficiently do that. We can overcome that through technology. Fermentation is a great example, but that's the one food we're designed to eat. So if, if anybody listening is trying to answer the question what they should be eating by looking at it and saying, okay, what am I designed to eat? And you're going to figure out what you're going to eat based upon the answers to that question, it's doomed for failure because we're not designed to eat almost everything. And I know this is going to sound controversial. We're not even designed to eat meat because we actually need technology to get that meat. Yeah. But do we do a great job on it? Absolutely. Have we included meat in our diet for millions, animals in our diet for millions of years? Absolutely. In fact, I truly believe that it's because we started to include animals in our diets that we were able to get that massive amount of nutrition in such a bioavailable way mm -hmm. that our bodies and our brains uh, could grow with that nutritional support behind it. We are literally humans biologically and culturally today because of the ways we included animals in our diet for 2 million years. And so that's why the, the better question and what you're posing here is how to eat food, not what food to eat. Because to your point, we kind of aren't good at eating anything unless we prepare it in the best way. And then we could, so it's like, how do you eat the foods we have available to us? Not what foods to eat. Yeah. Okay. Right. And and it's a combination, and, you know, as you just mentioned, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot to, to, to about the, um, about the spinach and the, and the time yes. of year, because I know I, I, sorry, I went on a tangent. Yeah. This is very, you're right. Eating seasonally, um, it ticks a lot of boxes. Mm -hmm. So I know it's one of those eating seasonally, eating locally, organic, all is kind of a buzzword right now. And they're all important at some level for sure. But one of the other things 
uh, seasonality does. It is a natural limiting mechanism in our in our diets. And we o- it was always there in the past, right? You didn't have grocery stores in the past. You didn't have freezers in the past. Um, so if you were eating something like spinach isn't wild, but let's use spinach for an example. I don't eat any spinach. I'll never eat spinach the rest of my life just because I have such an oxalate issue. But is there something inherently wrong with eating spinach? No. If you eat spinach the two t- the two weeks out of the year that it actually grows in your area, I don't mean growing because it's in a in a in a greenhouse and they're pumping in all sorts of heat and all that. I mean literally the amount of time that that plant um, grows in your area. If you ate it, then would you get a little more oxalates in your diet for two or three weeks or whatever? Sure, and then you won't have them for the rest of the year. You don't have them for a couple months to eat another plant. That that is fine. That's a limiting mechanism. It's kind of like. My issue with the oxalates came as a result of eating massive amounts of almonds. I ate massive amounts of almonds for years. That was, you know, that was my go-to snack. Mm. I'll get a handful of almonds and I'd eat it literally at least a handful of almonds every day. I mean, think about it. It's high protein. It's low carb. It's not that expensive. You go to Costco or BJ's, you get a big bag of shelled almonds. But if you think about it, we've removed limiting mechanisms because of the way the food chain works today. When I was a kid, I ate nuts. When I, I really ate nuts once a year, mm. it was Christmas. We'd go to my grandparents' house. They had a bowl of nuts with their shells on it mm. and a nutcracker. And I'd spend all afternoon happy as hell with a big <laughs> smile on my face, cracking these nuts. And I'd spend hours and I'd have a handful of nuts mm. and I'd eat them. Mm. Great. Mm-hmm. And I'd get a lot of oxalates probably from it, sure, once, <laughs> once a mm-hmm. year. And then, you know, if you tried to buy a bag of shelled almonds in 1985, it would take your entire paycheck. Mm. I mean, you couldn't do it. But now you can go to Costco and BJ's and buy a huge bag of shelled almonds. And everybody's took, you know, almonds and almond milk and almond flour. It's superfood. It's low carb. It's it's you know it, gluten free. If it's flour, and we're eating massive amounts of these things. We don't have the limiting mechanism of seasonality or having to harvest them or having to get the. Most people don't even. Most people don't even, most people know nuts have shells, but nuts also have a hole on the outside. Mm. So you have to not only find them and, and gather them, get the hole off the outside, usually dry them or roast them or something, then crack the shell off it and then go ahead and eat the nuts. You know, that's a completely different mm-hmm. thing. So we're getting rid of these limiting mechanisms. And, and one of the um, it, even cost is not there anymore. And one of the downsides is, you know, we're eating massive quantities of something that has the potential to harm us over yeah. time. So with modern Stone Age Kitchen, you that's where you you recently expanded right was it a physical space yes. expansion oh both okay. yes yeah. so uh one of the cool so <clears throat> my life was so transformed by the way that we approached i started to approach food i was very um uh, fulfilled and uh, with the way that i used that approach to to feed my nourish my family um that we start we actually opened a restaurant on the back of that book it's called the modern stone age kitchen and there's several things that we do here and several things that we don't and will never do here so we are very animal focused and we do all in-house butchering completely nose to tail uh and i when i say we literally using every single part of of the animal um we support local farmers uh we don't use any industrial nut and seed oils we only use animal fats uh the only plant-based fats that we use are we use olive oil and avocado oil in cold things like dressings and the like we do use some coconut oil so that's the only nut oil we use but it's a completely different beast Mm -hmm. um and again mostly in in cold things uh any grains that we have have go through some sort of a process to make them safer and more nourishing so any wheat is full sourdough um any seeds nuts or legumes are soaked or sprouted um, sometimes a combination of all these things. We just started doing some gluten-free. And just because there's not gluten in it doesn't mean those Healthy, flowers don't have sure. issues. So we all of those go through a full 100% wild long fermentation sourdough process as well. Uh, we choose low oxalate options. Uh, we don't use any refined sugars. We only use um, muscovado sugar, which is completely unrefined. It's literally pressed uh, cane juice. It's evaporated uh, honey and maple syrup and I, a couple other things but th- that's so we are f- focused on that how I mean, what is important to us but that how how can we take foods that people and families eat every day and make them as absolutely as nourishing as possible and uh so we have we have that restaurant we just expanded 
Um, we had into a building behind us, the goal there, and you're going to be excited about this. We got to get you down. Eventually that'll be our marketplace. So, um, people come in and eat with us and we have things to take away as well. So, um, we have, we make, and we make everything from scratch. Every, there's no two ingredients put together outside of our walls. We make all of our cheese. We make all of our meats. We make all of it. So people come and get fermented butter. They get yogurt from us. They get cheeses from us, all, the, all those things. So that we have sort of a market aspect, but we're going to increase that. And it'll be a full deli and uh, artisan butcher shop as well. So you can go in there. And so we're, we're in the midst of that, of that expansion. And upstairs where I'm coming to you from is our nonprofit. We have a nonprofit that uh, called the Eastern Shore Food Lab, which is, uh, where we do all of our research through uh, and all of our outreach and all of our teaching. We have a big teaching kitchen up here and we teach classes on everything from home butchering to sourdough bread to cheese making. Amazing. For the dairy stuff, do you guys, you use raw milk, I'm assuming? <laughs> yeah, because no, this is what I I'm going to say. It's like illegal most places, right? Still? It, it, there is a loophole in at least 46 states. Okay. That you can get some, so you can buy like in Maryland. Maryland is very tough on raw milk. Uh, you can get it in Maryland as pet milk. Yes, this is and there's, this is what we did in the like we used to go to a um, a farmer's market and ask for raw milk for our dog that we do not have, yeah. <laughs> and that's how we would get our raw milk. Because I mean, no one's checking and, and out. Like, so we can't. It, we um, actually, I have a call today with uh, the head of the uh, state for dairy uh, because we. You can you can if you have the right infrastructure, you can bring raw milk in to a facility, but you have to then pasteurize it. Um, or again, you need you need a specific infrastructure. You can make a raw milk cheese as long as it's aged for a certain amount of time. And part of that aging, just to go back to something we said earlier, has to do with the fermentation of that dairy, and it gets down to a certain pH, and then they consider it consider it safe. But here's the thing. We, we've been obviously drinking milk from our mothers, raw milk from our mothers, our entire existence. Mm -hmm. um, we've been drinking mi raw milk from other animals for at least 8,000 to 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. And pasteurization is, is is a brand new phenomenon. You know, on that scale, it's only about 100, you know, a little over 120, 130 years. It's, it's insane. And one of the problems so here's here's a very quick. Uh, I'll do a quick version. I know I keep diving on these. No, I love it. I love it. I love it. So I love it. This is what happens when we when we drink milk from our mothers, right? Again, we are mammals. We are perfectly designed to do this. So what I'm going to describe to you is what happens with all mammals. I don't care if it's a whale or a rat or a horse or a human. So several things are very important. One is the milk that's coming out of our mothers is at body temperature, and it's teeming with live bacteria. So when we start drinking from our mothers, this milk is coming uh, into our, into us already in the process of, of fermenting, right? Amazing bacteria designed through evolutionary processes to operate at body temperature mm -hmm. best, right? And it's coming. And then we as infant humans and infant mammals in general produce a whole lot of things like enzymes that help us digest that milk really, really well. So we, one of the, one of the enzymes is something called lipase, which breaks down the lipids or the fats. One is lactase, which breaks down lactose or the sugar and milk. Um, we also have a protease enzyme that denatures the proteins a little bit. Uh, for some mammals, it's something called chymosin. Humans, it's, it's a little bit different, but it works the same way. And what happens is uh, if you're, when you're an infant and all you're doing is drinking milk, and just taking in liquids, liquids pass through our digestive tracts way too fast for them to break down, for it to break down fully into its components to get absorbed, you know, by our intestines. And it passes way too quickly through our intestinal tract for those, all the nutrients to get absorbed properly. So what nature's figured out, and this is with mammals in general, is if we can denature the proteins, we can slow it down, right? And turn it into a kind of a semi-solid substance. It sits in our stomachs longer. It ferments it chemically and physically can get worked on by the stomach. Then it goes into our intestines and it sits there a little bit longer and those nutrients can get absorbed by our, through our intestinal walls. So um, this is all very important. This is how we efficiently and safely digest milk as infant humans. When we start to get wean, and it isn't just humans, it's animals and mammals in general, we suppress or lose the ability to produce all those enzymes. And we no longer can... Um, can safely and efficiently digest that milk. Lactose intolerance is not a weird thing. Lactose intolerance is actually the norm. 
the fact that some of us are lactose tolerant as adults, in other words, we produce that enzyme lactase as adults and can digest the sugars in the milk is actually a very, very weird thing. It's very weird in the world of animals in general, mammals, um, but it's because of a few different independent genetic mutations that took place in Europe and in Africa with populations that had strong reliance on dairy for thousands of years. 60% of adult humans around the world today are lactose intolerant. It's rare rarer to be lactose tolerant than it is to be lactose intolerant. So you take all that information, you say, well, and, and if you look at some of the, the veg or vegan arguments about milk, so we're not the, you're not designed to eat milk as humans, so why would you even consider doing it? But again, if we can replicate that process, that, we, that digestive process that we had uh, when we were infants, then we can safely and efficiently digest milk. I mean, if you want to think talk about technological inputs and things we're designed or not designed to eat, Three kidney beans, raw kidney beans, will you know land you in the hospital. More than that, you can get very, very sick from red kidney beans. Very, very sick. But if you take those kidney beans and you soak them overnight and then you cook them the next day, you've detoxified them to the point that you can more safely consume them. If you if I gave you a handful of raw wheat berries that you would end up making bread out of, but you, you down those at best they pass right through you. But there's uh, uh, nutrient robbing things in there. There's fight tastes, there's lectins, there's all sorts of nasty things. And you could get very, very sick from that. Mm -hmm. This is what I mean by we need to do things to our food, right? Before, before we consume it. So if we take that same approach and it's not, you know, what can I eat? What, how can I eat this? How can I safely and efficiently consume that theory? Well, let's talk about it. Well, number one, it should be raw because mm -hmm. what we drank as, as infants was raw. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, it should be fermented. That we, we had that fermentation step in our in our digestive tracts and third you don't need this necessarily but if you introduce that enzyme that coagulated the milk it, you can make a whole bunch of things like cheese mm -hmm. that that's called rennet in the cheese making world that very same enzyme it actually comes from usually from uh, calf uh, stomachs it's the same enzyme enzyme that works the same way so when you're actually making traditional cheese or making yogurt or making kefir you're actually replicating the biological process that your body just naturally went through when you were drinking from your mother. It's a completely different food. And I'll give you a really quick example of one of the things that happens. The food for the bacteria for the fermentation is actually the lactose. So if you ferment it properly, the lactose is either is greatly reduced or in many cases completely gone at the end of the fermentation process. So if you're lactose intolerant, it's not an issue with traditional fermented long fermented dairy. We ferment our yogurt for 24 hours. There's no lactose in it whatsoever. It's all been eaten up by the bacteria as a result of that process. Completely different food. Now here's the problem. And this is, do you, so raw, I'm a huge, huge advocate of, of raw dairy, but I'm a stronger advocate of raw fermented dairy. We can't make, you know, we make a lot of cheese here. We can't make cheese from most of the milk in the grocery store. The, because of the way it was pasteurized, the harshness of that pasteurization, the proteins are too screwed up. I can't get a curd to set. I, I, I literally just can't make cheese from it. So to me, even if you're not going to ferment the dairy, if you're consuming something that just doesn't even have the ability to go through that process, that natural biological process that you engaged in when you were an infant, then there's something wrong. So, you know, ultra pasteurized or highly pasteurized dairy, even worse, homogenized dairy is something that I, I, we have absolutely no business drinking. It's a completely different food than the kind of milk that you and I are talking about. High quality raw dairy is fantastic. High quality raw fermented dairy is even better. Mm -hmm. I love that you offer classes in this at your space. And I wonder how one has the time to run a restaurant and a nonprofit and a, you know, lab and also go to Ireland and like host these tours, like truly, I mean, is it just a, like a long, uh, and, and consistent process of just finding awesome people to help you? I mean, how do you have the time to do all this stuff? It's crazy. You have the same hours in the day as me, presumably. I mean, <laughs> well, number one is, I, the most important, amazing person in my life is my wife and my, my children. They're, they're just, I am so incredibly lucky to have the family that I have. They're, they're amazing. Um, and, and this is part of it is it is a family operation. 
So it's not like we're away from everybody right. by coming to work. Right. My, my wife and I work together every day. The kids are here all the time. They're actually my oldest daughter's at, at, uh, at college right now, but the other two will be here working today. So it helps that we're all here mm-hmm. together. So it's not a separate thing. But part of the reason that happened is because this is our life. Right. I mean, we are doing what we love and loving what we do. It, it, it really, I and mean, we're truly passionate about it. So work isn't like work. Um, although, I mean, it's work, but it's, yeah. the other thing is we have been very fortunate to put together a, an incredible team. We've only been open for two years. And I think right now we have 25 people working here. And what I love and I'm very proud of is the past couple of years have been very difficult. The restaurant industry got destroyed during COVID all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as things started to pick back up, one of the issues in the restaurant world is getting good help, like getting good staff. Um, it just was incredibly difficult. And getting it and keeping the, that staff, it hasn't been an issue for us. And I think it's because we have such a strong mission and such a strong message. We believe in what we do. We create a, a an atmosphere of, of, of community and nourishment through more than just the food like I talked about. And it is a wonderful place to work. I love it. And that's the only way we can we can make this happen. Yeah. It's amazing. It's it's definitely a 2024 goal of mine to come and visit. Um, okay, so I have some kind of just fun questions right now because I, I okay. want to be I want to be um, cognizant of your time, and we could be here all day talking. And you know, we'll do it again because we we have to. But have you've eaten a lot of stuff? Okay, and again, <laughs> like one of the reasons I love like watching your stuff and listening to you is because you have I feel like the same sense of like childlike excitement when you get to try something new and like unique and interesting that isn't very commonplace same as I do like I I just want to try everything you know even if it's something that's going to be really challenging and maybe that I won't like I just want to have the experience I just want to try it and you know you've tried a lot of different things and so I have to first question right off the bat I have to ask you how is beaver tail oh it's amazing Beaver tail is amazing. It's almost all fat. Yeah. And it is, um, it is. Awesome. And this was just, so this was part of your, your, um, your reality show experience. Right. right. And so this was just like c- cooked over a fire, eaten raw. How did you, how did you do this? You, you have to remember, I was really, really hungry. Of course. Which, which helps, <laughs> which, of which, course. which helps. But um, no, we, we literally had the beaver tail. We threw it right, right on the fire and we both sides and peeled the skin Ooh. off. And it was, you know, it was slightly, uh, we didn't do a great job of cooking it, but it might've helped in this case. It was slightly charred mm-hmm. might be the right word. And sometimes with fat that, you know, that crispy, so it helped. It, it was delicious. Okay. That, that is definitely a food that, um, was, is not one of those kind of dare myself to try to do right. it. it. It's, I would eat it again and again. And okay. Again okay. Sure. What about the cheese? with the maggots explain that for people who haven't heard it there is a cheese called kasu martsu that the that the um guinness book of world records years ago uh, labeled it the most dangerous cheese in the world which is absolutely ridiculous yeah. but they called it the most dangerous i would say cheese whiz is the most dangerous cheese in the world <laughs> yes. Anyway. <laughs> yes cheese was an american cheese right. is the most dangerous cheese in the world this is the co- anyhow this is how they make it for for most cheeses, most traditional cheeses, uh, you want to do everything you can to keep bugs, keep insects away. I mean, you want the bacteria bugs in there, but you keep insects away. And uh, sometimes there's things called cheese mites that come, which are usually bad. Um, but there's actually a cheese, a medieval cheese making tradition in uh, in Germany. There's one guy that's still making this cheese where they actually invite the cheese mites in and let the cheese mites do their thing. You know, we actually tried it. It was, it was great. His name is Helmut. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, the one guy, he's one guy making this cheese still. But in Sardinia, there's a cheese making tradition called Casu Marzu. And what they do is it's a, it's almost always a pecorino cheese, which means it's a sheet milk cheese. And the uh, aroma of that cheese draws a certain type of fly to it. And again, most of the time you want to keep the flies away. But for this particular cheese, the cheese maker, after they make the wheel of cheese, makes these little divots on the top of the cheese and around the cheese so that when the flies come, they have a place to actually lay their eggs. And they lay their eggs and the eggs hatch. And what what baby, you know, the larvae of flies are, are maggots. So they're these maggots. And they start crawling around the cheese and they start going into the cheese. 
And if you can picture what the maggot's doing to the cheese is almost like what an earthworm is doing to the soil, right? It comes out one end, goes through their digestive tract and comes out slightly changed and better off out the other end. So these maggots are digesting this cheese. It's going through their bodies and coming out the other end. And they're diving into this cheese and doing all this. And one of the things that happens is they have uh, they have this um, uh, lipase enzyme that attacks the fat and it transforms the fat. And it changes the texture, it changes the aroma, it changes the flavor in a really, really strong way. And you can either eat this cheese after the maggots have done their work and they're still covering the cheese, or you can wait until the maggots turn into flies and fly away and they've done their job. But that cheese at that point is a little bit changed and it's harder. So most people who eat the cheese do it still covered in maggots. So you're not only eating the cheese, it's been changed, but it's still covered in maggots. I'll tell you what it's what the... If you've ever had the strongest, literally, I mean like a a the strongest provolone you've ever had in your life, like that smell and taste on steroids is what this smell and taste is like. Yeah. And it's a, it's for the same reason, the same sort of enzyme. And it's softer on the inside. Um, when you make like brie and camembert and you have that soft on, on the inside, it's because of um, a reaction with the... The, the microorganisms that actually the microorganisms are actually digesting the cheese curd and making it soft mm -hmm. and changing the flavor mm -hmm. and changing the aroma. This is the same sort of thing, but the actual maggots are doing it. So I had it once my, actually my entire family didn't realize we were about to have it, but we had it once. And uh, it turns out one of my relatives in Campania made it and we didn't know what was happening. And we had a little bite and bugs were crawling on the kid's skin and they were like kind of freaked out, but they all tried it. But my wife and I were in, we were in Sardinia this time. I actually, made it a point to sit down and we made a little video of it and and try this cheese, and it is strong. Mm. It is illegal. If you are caught selling this cheese, it's like a sixty thousand euro fine. Um, you are not allowed to um, bring it into the U.S. I mean, it is it is a highly regulated cheese, but it's ridiculous because one and this is the other, one other kind of side note. It's kind of fun. Is one of the reasons most people eat it still covered in maggots is because the presence of the maggots, the presence of live maggots indicate that the cheese is still good. Mm -hmm. If something's gone bad with the cheese, then you're going to see a whole bunch of dead maggots. Mm -hmm. But if the maggots are still crawling around, it's one of these indicators that says, Oh, well, this cheese is, is still, is still good. So you can, you can eat it. Um, and it, it, it's, there's nothing, nothing dangerous about it when it's made properly. And it is quite the experience. But maybe eat it in very small amounts due to the strength. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it, to be honest, <laughs> you can't eat a lot. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> it, yeah. It, 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 it's strong. Okay. All right. Here's another one that I have to ask about because I'm just trying to think of the most like challenging and provocative foods of all time. Have you ever tried speaking of fermenting? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a dish in Iceland. It's fermented shark. Do you know about this? Yes, have you tried it? I've had it numerous okay. times. I went to the place they make okay, it. You have to tell me about this because I have been to Iceland once. It was before I knew about it. So I didn't get to try it. And I, I like to think of myself as open-minded in theory. I feel like I would try it, but I have watched, you know, I don't know. I'm pretty sure Anthony Bourdain tried it and like could barely get it down. Like it's something that is so challenging for people that I'm like a little intimidated by it. So what was the experience? All right. The experience was awesome because I went, I actually went to Iceland to do this cheese making uh, class. I, I was, I was a student in the class, but I had one day off. And the only thing I wanted to do was go to the Snellfuss Peninsula where there's a family still making the fermented syrup. So I drove myself out and I went and went to the little museum there. It was great. And so um, let me just, give you the quick rundown of, of why they do it because just like anything else the uh that cultural historic piece of it was part of the experience it's just very very quickly the greenlandic shark is one of the is one of if not the largest shark in the world and hundreds of years ago when people were still killing whales to get the blubber to make lamp oil the liver of the greenlandic shark is huge and it has a lot of fat, a lot of oil in it. And they would kill these sharks to get the liver and press out the oil. Uh, and, and because it burned so much cleaner than, than whale blubber, well, whale oil did. Um, so, but the rest of the shark is toxic. You can't eat it. So they would kill these massive, I mean, massively huge animals to just pull the liver out, to get the fat out of the liver 
to fuel lamps. And this went on for hundreds of years and throw the rest of the rest of it away. Well, about 400 years ago, that was about 600, about 400 years ago, they found out that if you fermented the flesh, it would detoxify it. And you could then it was safe for human consumption. So they started, they, they were still doing the thing with the with the livers, but then they would ferment the rest the, the flesh and then they, they would eat it. And it became a very, you know, part of embedded in their culture. It was, it was a cultural dish. Then obviously, they, for lots of reasons, they weren't killing these sharks for um for, for any reason. Um, but and it's illegal to kill them. I, I don't know if it's illegal, but nobody goes fishing for mm -hmm. them anymore. But it's actually, it turns out it's a bycatch of, I think, the cod industry. Hmm. But there's a big fishing industry where a lot of times, unfortunately, these sharks get caught in nets and die in the mm -hmm. process. So the family that makes these fermented shark now is actually taking, you know, I... the bycatch of another fishing industry and turning it into food, cultural, culturally significant food for, for Iceland. Um, and, and this is what they, they literally just take it and bury it in the ground. They just bury it in the ground. It ferments, and then it already has enough salt. You don't even have to add any salt. It's already salty enough that you just bury it. Then you take it and you hang it in these big sheds and let the air go through, and, and it dries out, and then it'll it'll store for a very, very, very long time. One of the problems is that sharks don't pee. They excrete right, urine right, right. through their flesh. Right. So there's a one of the one of the aromas. Not only is it this funky fermented aroma, but it's really strong ammonia mm -hmm. because of that. Um, the smell will make you want to vomit. But I will, and I know smell and taste are like so connected. But once you get it past your nose, it's actually not bad at all. I have served it. I brought it back. Um, I've probably given it to thirty or forty different people, and. There were about five of them that just couldn't do it. But everybody else was like, oh, it's not that bad. And again, wh why eat it if it's mm. just not that bad? Well, there's a lot of cultural significance to it, but it is sort of, in it's interesting. Right. I mean, it's an experience to try it. So if you get it, if, listen, if all you do is, there's a lot of flights that have a layover in Reykjavik. Yes. If you just have a layover, they sell it in the airport. You can get it in the airport. Okay, so I'm actually like geographically somewhat close to Iceland, like in the far northeast right now. And I want to believe, I want to believe that I could do it. And I'm so excited and interested in trying because to, like, it's not always about the most delicious thing. It's about the experience. And it's about learning yeah. about what, what this thing is and why it's significant. I'm just, I'm so fascinated and I'm not surprised that you tried it at all. Um, <laughs> we do have to wrap this up but is there anything is there any food that you tried first of all is there any food that you wouldn't try and is there anything that you tried that you were like you know cultural significance great whatever but like never again in my life would i do this if the shark doesn't do it i don't know if there's anything that would no <laughs> you know if you, if you if something that i think is stronger than the shark if you've ever had the uh the fermented fish in um like in, in in Finland and Norway, if you had this, I don't know. It, they they sell it in a can, okay, and it's fermenting. So when you see the can, you, it's actually illegal to put on an airplane because it'll explode. Um, it's illegal to bring into the country, but um, it actually swollen like the exact opposite of what yeah. you would do. You know, if you saw a can that's swollen, you got to leave it alone. Yeah. But this is actually fermenting, so there's a purpose to it. Uh, let me just tell you really one quick story with it because this is the answer. But this is this is a good story. So years and years and years ago, um, I have a good friend uh, from Sweden. It's made in Sweden as well, and he was sending me some things. Uh, he's a flint napper too, so he's sending me a bunch of rock and some antler pellets and things like that. And and he said, "I'm going to send you some of this, the, the, the fermented fish in the can." I said, "Okay." And he, I said, "What what what do I need to do? What's my instructions?" He said, "Okay, listen, you need to eat it with." dark dark bread onions and have a glass of beer mm. <laughs> great great Sign instructions I'm, I'm good so i was going i went to this um this primitive technology event uh and i brought it with me and i mean the primitive technology event that i went to it was like the burliest of you know hardcore outdoor men and women they bang on rocks they do survival stuff so i brought this uh, and we all gathered around a picnic table one night and i put it on the table i had dark bread I had onions. I had plenty of beer. Everything was ready. Everybody's excited. Somebody's holding the lantern. And I have this swollen can in front of me. And there's a lot of anticipation. And what I like to say is what happened the moment that I put the can opener on it, 
is embedded in my mind as strongly as when I got married, when I had my kids. I mean, it was that I literally punctured this can with a can opener and a fountain of rotten fish juice sprayed everybody. People were running around, got in people's eyes. It was horrible. And I finally opened it and it's bubbling. And out of all the, there must have been 40 people around, me and one other person were the only people that actually tried it. And same thing, the smell was horrible, the taste wasn't that bad. And then I called the guy, I said, what, what, what are you doing? Like, what, what, like it's sprayed everywhere. And he's laughing, he goes, oh, I forgot to tell you the most important part. I said, what? And he says, you're supposed to open it in a bucket of water. Oh. <laughs> so it doesn't spray everywhere. See, these are the times that you that, wish there's a camera on you, right? Like, Oh, it was, it was something, mm. but no, I, I, there's nothing I wouldn't eat again. Mm. There's some things I derive much more pleasure from, uh. from than others. But, um, my, my bucket list food to try is a witchetty grub in Australia. That's okay. That's Th- these bucket. are like the big, big, the big fat mm. ones. And this, what well, you know, you, you heat them up, you cook them a little and, and, and I understand you know, they're soft and I don't do soft insects. So I do great with crunchy yeah. things, but soft insects, not so good. So I think mentally I got to get over that, but they say the flavor is of like buttered. Pop. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. I I'm a fan of insects too. And it's, that's actually one of the areas where I started my like adventurous eating journey when I was like in my early twenties and same as you, I'm like crunchy stuff. I got it. Like grasshoppers, crickets, ants, give it all to me. Uh, And I find it interesting that there is kind of like another sort of subsection of, I feel like I'm like throwing the ancestral health world under the bus today in this, this chat, but it's just things I'm observing that there's kind of this like anti insect sort of conversation happening where I guess there's this narrative that, I don't know, the government or somebody is trying to like push insects as the next protein source instead of beef or whatever. And I don't know how much validity there is to that. All I know is that Again, it is a cultural thing. There are millions and millions of people on the planet that eat insects, varying types and and preparations, and that they can be incredibly healthful foods. And that it is sort of almost in some some instances, sort of an, an ignorance, the same way that the reaction that people have to me sometimes talking about organ meats is that's extreme and that's disgusting. And how could you? And these are the same people eating chicken breasts all day, every day. So it's like the which is extreme and weird. It's extreme and weird. And it's also a little bit hypocritical. If you'll eat yeah. one part of the animal, but you think it's it's uh, barbaric to eat another part. And, you know, I've always thought insects were really, really interesting. There's sort of a, a bit of a different maybe barrier to entry and intimidation factor of like learning how to even source them and access them and cook them properly. But I have a beautiful book and I can't remember the author, but I think it's like a Fiden book and it's just called like Eating Insects. And it's one of the most gorgeous books. Do you know about this one? I'll send you a picture. Yeah, it, came, it came out of Noma. Yeah. It came out of that. Yeah. Just, or the the door to food land. Just yep. gorgeous. But I mean, again, it's just another aspect. And this is why I love talking to you about this stuff. It's just like, it's just, it's just interesting and it's just fun and it's learning and it's, it's beautiful. Like trying new things mm-hmm. to just take away the fear of something different. Like it's a, maybe it's an instinctual human thing and it's gotten us far in a lot of cases to be wary and be fearful of things that are new or different. But again, we don't live in those times anymore. We live in an age of information and sharing and, you know, being able to have access to so many different things and so many different cultures. And I think if we just flip that switch a little bit of new can be fun, it can be interesting, it can be healthy, it can be delicious, it can be at the very least a new experience. I just think that if more people thought of food that way, you know, cause healthy food doesn't always have to be a chore. It doesn't have to be something you just have to get in because it's good for you. It can be, I mean, I think your restaurant shows very clearly, it can be incredibly delicious food that makes people really happy as well as, um, contributes to their health. So anyway, pro insects over here. I would, I would eat perfectly. So. I would eat a grub with you. Okay. One day, All one right. day, one day we'll do it. Um, Bill, I'm going to, I'm going to let you get on with your, your busy day here, but I so, so appreciate you coming on and chatting. And, you know, I really would love to do it again. Cause I think there's a lot of other, uh, rabbit holes we could go down, but for anybody who wants to maybe connect or learn more, what's the best way that they can, um, sort of connect with you or just learn more about what you're doing. 
Awesome. There's, there's a couple ways. So anything on the more academic research side, teaching side, uh, research side, uh, you can find out information about what we're doing at eatlikeahuman.com. Mm -hmm. So there's information about our classes and there's a blog we put out every week and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm on social media at Dr. Bill Schindler, so at Dr. Bill Schindler. And anything about the restaurant that we have or any of that kind of work is at Modern Stone Age Kitchen or modernstoneagekitchen.com. And just as a you know, to sort of geographically place us for anybody who's wondering yeah. where we are. We're in this beautiful little rural historic area on the eastern shore of Maryland, but we are only about an hour from Washington, D.C., an hour and a half from Philadelphia, and just a few hours from New York City. Yeah. So we're uh, we're very easy to get to. And uh, starting next week, I think we're going to be open Monday through Saturday. So please come and see us. And I can promise you what we're trying to do here is nourish the entire family. So it's not like, you know, if, if you're a carnivore, you can get food here. If somebody else in your family is eating something else, uh, we can, you know, we're, we're, we're making the healthiest versions of those foods as well. So we really hope awesome. to see you here. I'm planning another New York trip in November. I might have to just squeeze Absolutely. my way over. Okay. All right, Bill, thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, let's, let's do it again sometime soon. Anytime. Let me know. Thank you so much for having me.